Hello, everyone. Welcome in once again to another episode of the Poker News Podcast. My name is Jeff Platt. Thank you all so much for joining us. Joining me today, not just a co-host, but a semi-finalist for the Global Poker Award for Journalist of the Year. It is Chad Holloway. Chad, how you doing, man? Congratulations on the semi-finalist honor or nod or whatever you want to call it. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, my first time in that category, so certainly uh, honored. Some uh, some great names there, and we'll see if uh, we can make the finals. It would be uh, certainly be exciting uh, to say the least. And uh, you know, congrats to you as well for uh, you know for the nominations for this very podcast, which I seen on the sheet. They were kind enough to tack my name on it. There we the, go. The You're in end. the mix. <laughs> and to to Sarah Herring, of course, who who carried uh, you know the load with you on. Uh, Throughout 2019, I came on just there at the at the tail end, and then uh, broadcaster of the year. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And like you said, you know, we're just kind of honored to be on this list of legends. We'll get into more uh, of the Global Poker Awards in a little bit, but first, this is the perfect day to shout out our friends at Run It Once Poker because at the time of taping this podcast, Chad, Wednesday, January 22nd, 2020. The Galfon Challenge is underway. Phil Galfon taking on Venavidi in some high stakes PLO action. They're playing 100, 200. It's going on Twitch. My man Stapes is on the call. Have you gotten a chance to check this out? I mean, again, at the time of taping, this this thing is has just started, has just gotten underway. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but it's surely on my uh, you know agenda. We've been talking about it on the podcast here for several episodes. It's got the, you know, the poker community pretty excited. And, uh, you know, what we spend a lot of time talking about live events that's happened so far in 2020, this is definitely, you know, it's still fresh in the new year, but this is definitely one of online poker's biggest stories thus far. Yeah, I think so too. And, and you guys just pull it up on Twitch. You'll see massive pot after massive pot after massive pot. It's a lot of fun to watch. Um, and if you want to play on run at once, and don't live in the United States of America, check it out, once.run slash PN pod for an exclusive deposit bonus to Poker News Podcast listeners, once.run slash PN pod. And we've got a little rooting interest for Phil Galfon because if he wins the first part of this challenge, the splash the pot winnings, a little rake back, are doubled Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So again, once.run slash PN pod. And again, thank you to our friends at Run It Once. Okay, the Aussie Millions main event just got down to its final table. Its final table of seven, 820 entries in this, creating, Chad, what I'd like to say, or what everybody likes to say, I guess, by now, is a pretty good sign as far as attendance is concerned for the World Series of Poker main event. Yeah, I mean, the Aussie Millions has always been a good indicator of how well the WSOP main event uh, corresponds. I know Donnie Peters, formerly of Poker News, now of Pocket Fives, has uh, cut track of that and, and kind of really discovered that stat that that is, in fact, an indicator. So, you know, this is certainly a solid number. And, uh, you know, I think expectations are high for the 2020 WSOP main event. You know, my guess, just uh, calling it early, is that it's going to be bigger than last year's. So making it, uh, you know, the second largest ever I don't think we're going to get to the 2006 level yet, but okay, uh, okay. you know, if we continue on this trajectory, that could be in the cards in uh, you, this new decade. Yeah, again, this is a good sign. 820 entries down just two from last year. And I heard uh, Donnie talking about that trend on the Fives Poker Podcast with Lance Bradley. And Donnie was like, oh, I don't really know if I came up with this. You know, Maybe it was somebody else. Donnie, it was you, man. Take some credit for this trend. Chad, what a run for Mike Del Vecchio. Final tables two years ago, final tables last year, and finishes 10th this year. I mean, almost goes back to back to back final tables at one of the most prestigious tournaments out there. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I've talked about this with Jamie Kerstetter in the past, that there's such thing as geographical run good. You know, some people just seem to run really well at certain venues. You know, on the flip side, I know of a lot of players who just – they can't win at certain venues, no matter what they, whatever they, it is that they're doing wrong or what have you. But uh, clearly, Mike Del Vecchio runs very well at the Aussie Millions, plays very well. He's a great player, and uh, you know, going almost three for three, you know, mm. coming up just short, uh, 
three spots short, I think, technically. I think the Aussie Millions main event is, is seven um, for their technical final table. But, uh, yeah, just really impressive win. And, uh, you know, it's a shame that he couldn't have gotten there. That would have been a, one heck of a sweat. Well, yeah, we've said it right. I mean, I think it was last week or the week before we were talking about players who, you know, have ramped up their fitness regimen, players who are eating better. And I think it, it also that, that you can add to that list just your overall comfort with a certain location. You know, you go to Australia, the weather's great. You know, maybe he's a tennis fan. He's checking out the Australian Open as well. Maybe he loves the casino, the dealers. He's just comfortable there. I think there really is something to be said for that. It's like you're kind of creating this um, positive mindset in your mind, and that's certainly something that Mike Del Vecchio has done. Uh, so our chip leader is Nino Ullman as we enter the final table of the Aussie Millions. They take a day off. And then you can catch that final table on both Twitch, on runitup.tv, and on Poker Go. And Chad, the legend himself, fourth in chips, going into the final table with more than four million in chips. That would be Poker Hall of Famer Eric Seidel. Yeah, I mean, we just talked about geographical run good. And for Seidel, you know, he's a staple at the Aussie Millions. In fact, he sits second on the Crown Melbourne's all-time money list with more than 6.7 million. That's second only to Mr. Phil Ivey, who has 8.1 million in, in live earnings. And, uh, you know, I believe if uh, I, uh, Seidel were, were to win this main event, he would uh, take over that lead. So to see Seidel uh, at this final table with a stack is very exciting. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I love most about Seidel is, is how he's been able to keep pace with the younger generation of poker players. You know, his best years in poker have come after he was inducted into the Poker Hall of Fame, Yeah, which to me is just, you know, speaks volumes to just the sort of player that he is. Most people, you know, get inducted after their careers have wound down. Uh, Seidel just keeps on getting stronger and stronger. And he's by far the biggest name at this final table. The only other name that I recognize is Oliver Weiss. Uh, you know, he and he's too has a big stack, uh, 90 bigs deep. So, uh, I'm sorry, 75 big deeps by the looks of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, this this whole final table, the short stack right now is 38 bigs. So this is yeah. a this is a deep stack final table. There's going to be some great play, and uh, I really can't wait to see who who takes it down. Okay, Chad. So I got a beef with Oliver and and a couple of these German professionals. Why do you have to hide your results? on Hendon Mob. You know, you, you have the option to opt out, which is completely fair. And so some of these guys, Oliver included, are just like, nope, can't find me on Hendon Mob. Sure, you can find certain tournament results on different websites. But I just don't, I, I don't see what you're trying to hide. Like, like we know that a Reiner Kempa, for example, is a fantastic poker player. If I sit next to Reiner, I'm, like, I'm not gonna be like, oh, well, because you're unknown on Hendon Mob, I have no idea who you are. And it's kind of the same with Oliver. It just like, I, I, I don't, do you see the positives in doing this? I think the only positive and probably the most likely explanation has to do with taxes, right? So the tax situation in different countries varies. And I know in a lot of European countries that, uh, you know, there's been incidences in the past where uh, governments have looked at Hendon Mob to find okay. out winnings and to go after, uh, after that without really the understanding of how poker works, right? So they just see that somebody cash for um, 500,000 in the 250 K, but don't realize they fired three bullets. So they actually lost money. And uh, so I think that uh, maybe there are a lot of European players because of the privacy laws out, uh, on that side of the pond, they have the option to kind of opt out of these things. And I think that's probably why they do it, you know, better safe than sorry. Uh, obviously it's frustrating from my perspective as a poker yeah. journalist or media, you know, person to, to go look up a result and, and see, unknown listed as the winner of a tournament <laughs> and then you know i gotta track down who the winner uh, was elsewhere and just a little more work for me but uh yeah i mean i get it it is frustrating but if i was in their shoes and playing for millions of dollars i probably would do the same thing too okay okay i mean it's a very it's a small bone to pick but it, it's one that bothers me it makes sense um with the government and it's not like the players are lying on their taxes but you said it if the government doesn't understand poker results that means they also probably don't understand staking backing Etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so it makes a little sense, whatever. It is still very annoying. Um, let's go back down under for this next story, and a cool story at that. Lynn Gilmartin and Kale Burns inducted into the Australian Poker 
Hall of Fame. Uh, it's really cool for Lynn Gilmartin. The timing of this is spectacular considering the fundraiser that she started, Poker Players for Australian Wildlife. You can, fo- you can find that all over Lynn's social media accounts. She's a, a, a staple of the poker industry. She's been a, a World Poker Tour anchor for a while now. And, and I think, I really do think that she's one of the best broadcasters out there. And I, I just think this, this honor for her is, is so well deserved. Yeah, like you said, the timing is great. I, I don't think it had anything to do with it. I think Lynn was right, getting right, in right. one way or the other. Uh, you know, she has she started her career at the Crown Melbourne. A lot of people don't, uh, you know, realize that. And then she came to Poker News for many years before going to the WPT, where she's been a, a longtime member of that family. So to see Lynn get this honor was very exciting for me, uh, you know, having known her. But, uh, you know, poker fans should be excited about it as well. Lynn deserves it. And, uh, you know, it, it was just a really awesome moment. And like you said, the, I think the timing really did make it even more special. And then, of course, she got inducted alongside uh, a guy we talk about on the podcast all the time, <laughs> Kale Burns. Uh, and that, uh, you know, when I first saw it, I'm like, man, he seems a little young. But then I really think about all he has accomplished and how long he really has been in the game. And, uh, you know, these Australian legends like Joe Hashem, that are welcoming him into the Hall of Fame certainly deserved on his part too. So for these two people to get in together is exciting. And, uh, you know, I've been at the Aussie Millions when they've done the Poker Hall of Fame uh, induction for for Australia. And it's exciting. You know, it's a big deal down there. So uh, congratulations to both of those players. Uh, to, well, not both those players, to Lynn and to, to Kale. Yeah, Burns, another guy who really just started his career at Crown, grinding and grinding and grinding. And and the grind has has paid off for Kale Burns, two-time WSOP Europe bracelet winner last year. He's won, uh, I think, four major titles in the last couple months with a couple second-place finishes. I mean, the man has just been on an absolute tear. All right, the Global Poker Awards have announced their semi-finalist list. Um, You all can vote on that for about another day or so I think voting closes on Thursday night and so you know what we've given credit to Eric and to these GPAs for the last couple of weeks for changing up their system for changing the way the voting panel works for switching up the categories for adding new categories etc cetera, etc cetera. and I want to save Chad or kind of go through each category and pick out the winner um spot until we have narrowed down the field a little bit i do though just think it's important to acknowledge that the semifinalists are out that the fans can vote that the fans have a say um chad if you had to pick your let's say favorite category that's out there this year what would you go for and you can't pick journalist of the year because you're involved (laughs) in that you can't pick podcast of the year because you're involved in that um you know one of the categories that certainly sticks out to me is event of the year and that's uh, just to say for this year because normally people would argue that the WSOP main event should always win event of the year sure. and it's a pretty good argument you know it's hard to to argue against it except for this year I felt there are some strong contenders to give the main event a run for its money the big 50 for example at the World Series of Poker was just a tremendous event the largest poker tournament in history as far as entries Um, just very special anybody who was there knows how special it was anybody who participated in it knows how special it was so I think that's a strong contender and then of course the poker stars PSPC right the first one took place in 2019 in January and that was I mean I was there I had the opportunity to actually play it which was was grand and it was just a very special event as well so um, you know those two being in the same category as the uh, WSOP main event as well as some other tournaments like the WPT five diamond uh, and you know some great events around the world I think that's a really strong category this year that uh, I was pretty excited about yeah same here um, uh, yeah I just think that tournament was was so uh, special so unique you know that doesn't discount other tournaments but yeah that'll be a tough category I really like this year the hand of the year which is entirely up to the people entirely up to the fans doesn't rely on the voting panel you can go to globalpokerindex.com you can click on their link for the global poker awards to vote in all the categories but it's just a lot of fun to watch all of these hands I think they have let's see one two three four five six they have like 16 hands listed um and they're all just 
absolute classics. You know, Stephen Chidwick's hero call for all of his chips at the Triton Million. Sam Trickett's massive bluff at that very tournament. Kristen Bicknell against Phil Ivey against the aforementioned Kill Burns. Aces versus Kings versus Queens when Chrissy B spikes a queen. Bryce Yockey's historic bad beat. I mean, there are just so many awesome hands. It's just fun to relive all of those moments. And, you know, scouring uh, poker Twitter yesterday, it's hard not to run into some Doug Polk talk. And Doug Polk tweeted, the GPI Poker Awards finals came out yesterday, and this time I'm not even nominated for any category. Last year I made 74 poker videos for 35 million views. I covered hands, news, and all kinds of poker topics. I didn't play poker, but it was my most successful year ever for content. He goes on, he says, this is the list for vlogger of the year. This is the ranking of viewership for poker. You know, I'm at the top, blah, blah, blah. But I have no nominations for anything. Here are my thoughts on that, Chad, and I want you to chime in with yours after. Doug Polk is an absolute superstar. No other way to phrase it. In, in the YouTube world, the man just gets hits. 34 million views on his videos in 2019 for his poker content. That is absolutely out of this world. Second place is Brad Owen with 21 million, just to put that into perspective. With that said, the categories of this year's Global Poker Awards do not necessarily set themselves up to have Doug Polk as a nominee. Now, I think you can make an argument that this guy, the superstar, has to be included in the Global Poker Awards somehow, some way. So next year, let's look at things. Maybe we need like just a best overall content creator. And then boom, you know, it's, it's Doug Polk, uh, at least a semifinalist, at least a nominee. I just don't think it's set up for him. This like vlogger of the year. He doesn't, he doesn't do vlogs. That's not what he does. Media content of the year video. Those are set up for very specific segments, very specific moments. Not that he can't be involved in those. I just think it's more about his overall content creation. And so, again, the way it is aligned this year, the way the categories are set up, I just don't think there's a spot to plug Polk in. You get what I'm saying? I, I think he's, he's one of the best out there as far as content creation is concerned. I just don't see where you plug him in. Yeah, I get the point that you're making. I think it's certainly a fair point. I think another aspect of it for me as well is, you know, there's no denying how big Doug Polk's audience is. I mean, you said the numbers. It's absolutely huge. It's massive. But like he said, he didn't really play much poker. He didn't really do, uh, you know, much outside of his own uh, his own avenue, his own audience, you know, yeah. right? So if there are people who vote for these awards, you know, and there are a lot of uh, media members, a lot of players, a lot of tournament directors, uh, industry folks and things like that. If all you're doing is catering to your own audience and staying in your own lane and not really putting yourself out there and getting noticed and interacting with, uh, you know, these other players, these industry members, the media and, and, and all that, it uh, can be a little out of sight, out of mind. Not every tournament director is watching Doug Polk stuff. Not every sure. media member is, um, you know. So it's, it's one of those things. I, I certainly get his point. I get his frustration. Um, I understand your point of, yeah, where do you really slot him in? But I, I also think that uh, a lot has to do with remaining in the overall poker consciousness. And, uh, you know, in 2019, you know, you, you just don't see Doug Polk playing these tournaments. And so you don't get that constant reminder. Now, of course, his audience, his followers, his, you know, loyal viewers do because they're getting yeah. the subscription notifications and everything when it, when it happens. But as far as, you know, others, you gotta, you gotta reach out and, uh, you know, the way the global poker awards are set up, you know, it's those people that I kind of just mentioned, the industry veterans and, and those sort of people that you really have to appeal to. So maybe there's an argument to be made that, uh, you know, that part of it was neglected a little bit. Yeah, well said. Um, before we get to a couple of guests headlined by 2004 World Series of Poker main event winner, Greg Raymer. Chad, why don't you go into the details of a brand new poker tour? Yeah, so this was actually in the works for a while, became public, I actually think back in December, but really is starting to gain some momentum now. And that is uh, three MGM properties along the East Coast here in the United States have joined forces to launch a new poker tour called the East Coast Poker Tour. Uh, the ECPT, it's by MGM, so technically the MGM East Coast Poker Tour. And the three properties are MGM National Harbor, MGM Springfield and Borgata. And so basically what they're going to do for 2020 is combine the events that they run throughout these, uh, these stops. There's going to be five of them 
this year, the Potomac Winter Poker Open coming up in February. Poker News will be there offering there live updates. Yep. Same as the uh, Borgata Spring Open uh, in April. And then in July, the Borgata Summer Poker Open. Then there's another Potomac Poker Open, the Summer Edition, in July and August. And then the Armory Classic at MGM Springfield in August. So five events. And what they're going to do is keep a leaderboard throughout these events, right? And so it's not too unlike the WSOP Circuit National Championship leaderboard, whereas uh, you, you mass some points, the top 90 finishers are going to win a seat into, uh, it's a $3,500 seat into November's Borgata Fall Poker Open uh, Two million guaranteed championship at Borgata. So um, there's some other prizes involved in that leaderboard. If you want to check it out, go to PokerNews.com. Just search uh, East Coast Poker Tour. Uh, you will come up with the article. All the details are there. But uh, I think it's really uh, a really good idea that you have all these properties under the same umbrella, under MGM, finally come together and say, hey, why don't we you know, thread all these events together, have some sort mm-hmm. of common theme, some kind of common goal. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's a wise move on their part. And uh, I think, you know, people on the East Coast should definitely be excited about this. Yeah, 90 seats to a $3,500 main event. I mean, that's great for the people who are firing all these events. It's also great for the people who are just firing that main event. A lot of added value in that. Uh, I, I think it's really cool. You know, I, I like seeing tours like this. And Chad, I can't help but think that MGM, while getting going in the live realm like this, we're also in the next couple of years going to see some major moves from MGM made in the online market as well, would you say? Yeah, I mean, there's already kind of rumblings, you mm-hmm. know, about that. I, I I think that's certainly the case. We've already got, uh, you know, some online poker in New Jersey, which is right in their neck of the woods. We're going to con- uh, continue to see that grow. And uh, yeah, I look for them to to become, I think, a major player in the online space and uh you know if they can get into the nevada market really give wsop.com a a run for its money love it all right we have a five-time heartland poker tour main event winner that is five time five time and that would be the aforementioned 2004 world series of poker main event winner greg raymer chad he put on a clinic at hpt ameristar he did, yeah. I mean, it was very exciting. The first stop of the HBT 2020 season, and Raymer, you know, he was a poster guy for the Heartland Poker Tour. Won four titles in a single year, but uh, you know, of course, that was back in, gosh, I don't even know, 2013 ish, something like that. Um, so kind of out of sight, out of mind. Great accomplishment, but kind of fell off the radar. Come storming back this year you know, tops a 520 entry field, I believe it was, to win the 1650 main event at Ameristar East Chicago. I've played there. I've played this event before. It is a tough field. And so for Raymer to go in there, win his record fifth title, certainly exciting. And uh, that's one of the reasons I was excited to chat with him about the win. Here it is. All right, I am joined now by 2004 main event winner, Greg Raymer. But uh, the reason we're having you on the call, Greg, you're now a five-time Heartland Poker Tour champion after winning the HBT Ameristar East Chicago for $171,000. And, you know, congratulations on that victory. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, it feels good to win anytime, uh, any amount. And uh, this was a very nice amount as well. You know, I was looking over your handed mob, and this is actually, you know, your biggest score in a while. Your first uh, six-figure score, it looks like, since uh, 2012. Uh, But you still have been playing, you know, pretty much a full schedule every year, right? Yeah. I, uh, you know, live in Raleigh, North Carolina, and there's no uh, legal poker here. But... I spend close to half the year on the road. I always spend the full summer, the month and a half, excuse me, um, in Las Vegas. And uh, then I travel around to other events like this HBT and other kind of, I guess they call mid-major events. Right. Well, speaking of traveling, that's actually what you're doing right now as I'm talking to you. Uh, You mentioned off the air that you are just an hour into a 40-hour drive cross-country. Where where are you headed? Uh, My first stop, you know, 
know, besides having to stop and, you know, get sleep in hotels is uh, Santa Maria, California, because my daughter, who recently graduated University of Michigan, has her first job there, and she had her uh, mom's old uh, car hand-me-down, and that had some issues, and the repairs were more than the car was worth. So I am now sitting in this 2015 Ford Escape that we got her, and we were trying to hit our carriers, but that's kind of a wait and, you know, you take, you know, you, you put up through a broker on a website and drivers might offer to do it for more. And then all of a sudden our daughter's like, hey, you know that door that was kind of hard to open, that driver door? Now I can't open it at all. So literally to use her car now, she has to get in the passenger side and crawl over the console to uh, get into the driver's seat. So she didn't really want to wait any longer, and therefore I decided, well, I have an appearance coming up at the Black Oak Casino in Tuolumne, California, which is not that close to her, but I might as well just drive her car out there and get it to her quicker. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly kind of you, and just coming about uh, four or five days after you won the the HPT. Let's talk about that win real quick. It was a, you know, it was a, a good event. 1650 main event, 520 entry field. So uh, it was a great turnout. And like I said, it's your fifth uh, HPT title. I think the other four came all in the same season back in 2012, was it? Correct. And so we're, you know, seven, eight years in between all those. You now have the record for most HBT titles. You know, what was it like going through that field? And did you find that, you know, the HBT now is any tougher than it was, you know, say back in 2012? Oh, it's tremendously tougher. But I think every tournament is tremendously tougher now than it was, you know, eight and 12 and 20 years ago. Um, I'm a much better poker player now than I was when I won the main event in 04 and yet compared to the field I'm losing ground because they're just all improving so much um, so it, I mean and that's true of anyone if you're the best no limit tournament player in the world right now the edge you have on the field is much smaller than you know, any of the top 10, 20% of the players had back then before the poker boom. So it's just much tougher now to, uh, you know, to have the sizable edges that you used to be able to enjoy. Um, and that's true, not just of an event like this that has a significant buy-in, but, you know, even if you're just talking the, you know, like $50 daily tournaments at your local poker room, um, it's not that those are fantastic players who don't make mistakes but they're just nowhere near as soft as they were, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, and, and what do you think accounts for that? I know over the years you've done a lot of, you know, training sessions. I've actually been to one in the past myself. You released a book, uh, The Fossil Man's Winning Tournament Strategies with D&B Publishing. You know, so there seem to be a lot more resources nowadays, but different resources, I'd say, than there were back in the mid-2000s. Uh, you know, think, do you think that might have an influence as why players have gotten so much better? Well, that's certainly a big part of why the very best players are so good, um, because they make use of these things. Uh, the books written nowadays tend to have much better advice. Um, way back then, there was a handful of authors you could trust, and other books written before the poker boom, some of them, even at the time, it was clear to any half-decent player that this book is full of really bad advice. Um, and. I'm not just talking people looking at it now, but even in the in that time when we didn't have as much math and simulation work, um, you know, there weren't solvers, there wasn't poker stove, any of those kinds of tools, um, good players would still say, wow, this book's horrible. Um, and now some of the books that we thought were really good back then were like, well, it's not that this guy was wrong or stupid or whatever when he wrote it. It's just we've learned a lot, and some of this advice is just too weak, tight to really be the best way to play in today's game. And 
So I think the best players have all those tools and online training and everything else to improve. And then all the other players who don't really put in as much effort, they still kind of pick things up, you know, in their poker rooms. Um, you know, I think back to, like, playing this daily Tuesday night no-limit tournament at Foxwoods because that's I used to live in Connecticut before I won the main event. And, you know, if you open shoved ten big blinds with a hand like ace-10 from the button, people would think you were a maniac. <laughs> like, oh, my God, how could you, like, risk your tournament life? You, know, you don't even have a pair. Um, and they just didn't even understand, you know, most of us didn't, that, like, if that's not a smart move, then what is? Because these guys in the blinds are probably only going to call with the top, you know, 3 to 5% of all hands. So, to be honest, you should be shoving any two cards from the button and it's profitable. Sure. Um, people just didn't understand that. But now you see that people do get that. And they do know that, you know, even if someone's not that strong of a player, and they might play horrible at other times in the tournament when, you know, the effective stack size is 50, 100 big blinds or more. But they still know that, like, oh, I'm down to, like, 10, 12 big blinds. I'm going to shove or fold. So even if they're not drawing the line perfectly and if they're shoving some hands they shouldn't or folding some hands they ought to shove, they're still not doing really stupid stuff like limping in and folding to a raise when they have that 10 big blind stack. Sure. And people people used, used to let themselves blind down to almost nothing because they're just like, well, I'm not going to risk my tournament life with a bad hand. And yet that same person would have, like, call the raise in level one with, you know, something silly like 10-7 off suit. <laughs> yeah. Um, it certainly, you know, it reminds me of, I know one person who likes to whittle down his stack is, you know, Phil Helmuth. And um, players used to say, if you're 10 big blinds, you're in danger zone, you got to shove. But I think nowadays you see players aren't afraid to get down further, you know, down to five bigs before they they really feel the pressure to uh, to make a move. Kerry Katz is another player who, uh, you know, shows a great deal, a deal of patience before feeling he has to make a move. Well, certainly, you know, if you have ten big blinds, it's not that you just have to shove as soon as you see anything half decent, but for the most part, you know, if you're going to play the hand at all, you probably should be going all in. So you can still be fairly tight at that point and blind down a bit. But I'm, you know, I remember watching an episode of one of the early HVT events from the first couple of seasons of that tour where a guy at the final table has six big blinds and he opens to 3X. Someone re-raises enough to put them all in and then he tanks and folds, you know, and it's just like, you're crazy. Like, you shouldn't have made that raise. You should have gone all in for your 6X. And then I don't care what you have at that point. You're getting over 3 to 1 on the call. You don't fold. Right. And the funnier part of it was that the guy who did this had ace jack, and the guy who put them all in had ace 10. <laughs> so now he invested half of his stack, folded getting 3.5 to 1, pot odds, and he was a 3 to 1 favorite to win if he had called. So it was just a, you know, comedy of errors type hand. And you just don't see that kind of silliness anymore. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. It's certainly something that, uh, you know, it used to be, uh, you, if you played at a poker table back in the mid-2000s maybe, there were two, three players who really got the game, understood what they needed to be doing. Uh, the rest maybe were okay, and then you had, you know, for lack of a better word, some fish at the table. And nowadays you're lucky if there's one player at the table who, you know, doesn't really know what's going on. But uh, it just stems to what we're, you know, the point we, we're talking about right now, that uh, poker is certainly much tougher now heading into the new decade than it was, you know, back, uh, you know, back when you won the main event. Well, I mean, I just have to look at this final table. I mean, if you looked at this final table on paper and didn't know any of us and you just, like, went and did your research on the Hendon mob, so... Obviously, I had the best resume in terms of, like, wins, results, total caches, and all that. Uh, Dave Goodfriend was at the final table. 
he has a good resume. He's won an HBT, you know, so he's had some six-figure scores. No one else had a tendon mob page that looked impressive at all. Some of them had no caches in events higher with a higher buy-in than like four or five hundred bucks. You know, so you would think that these other seven players wouldn't be very good because they just don't have that many results and no big results, no wins in big events. And yet all of them played really well. Sure. So no one played stupid at this final table at all. Um, you know, maybe if I'd seen everyone's cards, you know, if I've been watching the live stream, I would have seen more mistakes. But, you know, from the outside, not seeing stuff, it's kind of like these people played either really well or at least reasonably well, despite not having, you know, strong resumes and, and tournament results. Right. Well, Greg, let me shift gears real quick. I want to talk to you about something that you've been very transparent and open about over the years, and that is selling action. Each year, you know, you seek out investors and then, you know, put together a tournament playing package and you did the same for 2020 uh you mentioned in the winner interview that uh you know it obviously a great start you won one hundred seventy one thousand dollars. that uh you know you tripled your bankroll of the year in the first event and uh you know what was it like to just i don't know to get that pressure off if you will or to start the year in such a big way yeah i wouldn't describe it as getting the pressure off um you know, that's the nice thing that I don't really feel the pressure playing for these other people, but I do feel the motivation. So I don't have a tilt problem, but it's even more incentive to never tilt that, uh, hey, you know, it's not just my money here if I, you know, lose self control and play silly. Um, so mostly I'm just happy that I can, you know, at this point, you know, in the very first event we play, I can almost guarantee these people a profitable year. Um, we're going to have to run really bad all year long to uh, burn through this 170000 And therefore, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to win for them. When I won the main event, I had people that owned pieces of me. And, you know, I was perfectly happy as I was sitting there like writing checks to these people for like over two million dollars yeah I mean I'm sure they were they were certainly thrilled too I know a lot of the investors this year will be excited uh, you know to have you win the HPT right off the bat but as part of your arrangement if I understand it correctly you know that money stays in the bankroll throughout the rest of the year and you know might allow you to play uh, some bigger events if it fits within your schedule you know is that the case and uh, something you might look to do later in the year um, yeah you're right the I what I tell all the investors is I'm going to use reasonable bankroll management guidelines and deciding what size of tournaments and cash games to play in. But no matter what the bankroll is, so even if it gets very small, I'm still going to buy into tournaments with an entry fee up to like 2000 And mostly because all the investors would want it as well, no matter where the bankroll's at, we're going to use it for the main event at the World Series of Poker. Because that's actually one of the questions I get a lot from the newer investors is like, hey, does this include the main event? Because um, they want a piece of that action. So with those two exceptions, you know, I don't play in events that are too big. So we started off this bankroll at $90,000. Other than the WSOP main event, I was never going to be entering a 10K, you know, or even a 5K event because that's too big for that bankroll. Now that we've, you know, grown it to over a quarter million, now I might play some 10Ks uh, this summer. I'm certainly be willing to play, you know, the 3K, 5K type buy-in events as well. Um, so that gives us more potential, but... You know, with a quarter million dollar bankroll, I'm not jumping into any like high rollers, 25k and above. That's still too big for this bankroll. 
Well, Greg, I, uh, I'm certain that, uh, you know, if anything, you know, happens like it did in 2012 where you won four HPT titles, you already got one or less than three weeks uh, into the new year. You know, I'm sure there'll be bigger uh, and better things in store for 2020, and, uh, you know, maybe we'll be chatting again on the podcast. Hey, I'm happy to, to talk with you anytime. Uh, you know, we can discuss any of these things, tournament results. Uh, you know, happy to get into more detail on my book. Um, you know, my training seminars and, and any of that kind of stuff as well. Or I'm also the kind of guy that is always into things like rules discussions and structure issues. And I know one of the big topics nowadays is limiting rebuys, reentry in these events. That seems to be a hot topic. So anytime. Happy to chat with you, Chad. All right. Well, before I let you go, you just mentioned your book. You mentioned the training. If there are listeners out there that want to, you know, get the book or check out the training, why don't you uh, let them know how they can do that? Uh, the easiest thing for anything is to just go to my website, FossilManPoker.com, or follow me on Twitter, at FossilMan, and I will be, you know, posting stuff in those locations. Uh, my book is available from V and B publishing um, but you can also find it in your typical places like Amazon and stuff like that um, and that's Fossil Men's Winning Tournament Strategies uh, right now I'm on the road to deliver this car and then it's at the Black Oak Casino in Tuolumne, California which is a wonderful little spot if you haven't been there it's not a huge you know dot on the poker road map because it's a you know, it's out kind of in the woods near Yosemite Park, six-table poker room, but great action if you want to play, you know, smaller games, you know, one, two, no limit, stuff like that. Um, people are super friendly. Like, no one seems to lose their temper or misbehave there at all, which is super nice. And I'll be doing seminars there on the 29th, 30th, and 31st of this month. All right. Thank you to Greg Raymer for taking the time to chat with me. Uh, no video for this one, unfortunately. He's driving cross country to deliver, I think, a vehicle to his daughter in college. So uh, oh. he, yeah. So he uh, he was chatting with me there on the drive, and uh, appreciate him making the time. And what a great way for him to start off 2020. You know, he sells action every year, a year long package, and so for him to already. Um, profit in the package for his investors is exciting. And uh, as we talked about, he can now use some of that funds to play some more events or bigger events. And uh, who knows, 2020 could be a, a big year for Fossil Man. Chad, you play a decent amount of poker. Could you imagine effectively free rolling the rest of the year and it's January 22nd today? How good would that feel? You know, I, uh, I had a close call in 2016. I played a full schedule at the WSOP. Mm -hmm. And part of that was run it up Reno right before it. Okay. And I was doing well in the main event. I got to the final table. I was second in chips. Uh, or I, I was actually chip leader or something. I, I was just, I was cruising. I had my eye set on the $55,000 first place prize, that which basically covered the summer package. Instead, I punted away. I finished in ninth for like, I don't know, four or 5,000 bucks. And uh, yeah, so I, I had close to a taste of what it would be like to be free rolling. I'm sure my investors that year would have loved it, but uh Alas, I just, um, yeah, just punted it away. So was that a sign of what was to come in the summer or did you rally <laughs> during the series? Uh, it was not a profitable summer. It was, okay. it was close to a break even summer though, okay. which was, right. yeah, which was, uh, you know, I think a win in a lot of poker players books. So it certainly was in mine. I would have loved to have, uh, you know, won something out there, had a big uh, six figure score, but, uh, you know, all, all said and done, I broke even essentially and got to play uh, a lot of WSOP events. So that was pretty cool. Okay, a couple more stories to hit, um, and we also have a giveaway at the very end of this podcast, so stay tuned for that. But I'm going to go off on a little poker tangent also, Chad. I was firing uh, the win, 100K guaranteed yesterday, $400. I'm on bullet, like, you know, six or seven, something like that, just donating uh, to the field like usual. Blinds are at 501K. Don't worry, folks, this isn't about just a hand history here. Um Big stack under the gun opens for 2,500 or so. I just rip it in with kings on the cutoff because I'm not very good. I don't know how to do anything else except shove. I shove for about 20K in the cutoff with pocket kings. Very good hand. Small blind, tanks for a while, maybe a minute-ish, not terrible, and does make the call. Uh, the big stack folds. I show my two kings. He goes, Psh, 
Unbelievable. You know, I was hoping you wouldn't have those. And then he shows two aces. So to get slow rolled like that by a guy I didn't even know. Now, if I, if I know you and I'm friends with you and you slow roll me, I'm just like, you know, well played, sir. But in that case, I was not particularly pleased. And then another guy shouts out, oh, and I folded a king. I'm like, oh, great. You know, thanks for letting me know. I'm in a fantastic mood right now. Uh, needless to say, the king uh, did not pop up, did not get there. No justice in this world, Chad. Hey, Jeff, you want to hear a cool story? Yes. I was at the WSOP circuit Thunder Valley and I got the chance to play the $1,700 main event. Okay. Same exact story, except for I had the aces. The chip leader had uh, Kings and a guy said, Hey, I folded a King. And then the case King spiked on the river (laughs) and that's how I busted that main event. So I I mean, I I kind of feel the pain, kind of, you know, similar hands, uh, but uh, yeah. Decent uh, sized pot in that one? Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, the blinds were, uh, I think eight sixteen hundred, and it was for a hundred k pot only oh, free. God. Yeah, yeah, that's so, a lot of fun. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, good times. Well, Chad, speaking of the World Series <laughs> of Poker Circuit Thunder Valley main event, uh, you were out there. Tell us a little bit uh, about your trip and and then about this main event winner. Yeah, we talked about it in the prior episode. I was looking forward to this trip, and I'm happy to report back that Thunder Valley definitely lives up to its reputation. Nice. It was uh, it was awesome. I really enjoyed the property. The hospitality was there. The poker room is uh, you know among the best that I've I've been in. I will definitely be returning there uh, you know in the future. Definitely for the Run Good Poker series is going there in November. Uh, so I'm going to check that out for sure. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't say enough good things. They, they just, Ben Irwin and his entire crew, Justin Hammer was there. They just put on a really good show. And, uh, you know, it was a, a great turnout for overall for the series. Looking over, you know, the opener event got 1,319 entries, which was, uh, you know, tremendous. The actual main event was down year over year, but uh, still got 487 runners for the $1,700 main event, which, you know, considering all the competition going on right now, I think is a a, a good number. And, uh, you know, I played that event. I just told you what happened. It didn't go my (laughs) way. So that kind of sucked. But, uh, you know, it was fun to watch things play out, to be there for the final table. Uh, And uh, it was actually Jamie Haletke who took it down, you know, a player who really is kind of a local at Thunder Valley. He's had some success in other tournaments there not known to the larger poker world. You know, he is a mathematician who does cryptography in the uh, the Bay Area. So he loves poker. He went there and, uh, you know, he conquered this field for 147000 bucks, a seat into the 2020 Global Casino Championship. And I actually caught up with him right after winning, got a little, you know, post-winners interview for y'all right here. All right, sitting here with Jamie Haletke shortly after winning the WSOP Circuit Thunder Valley main event. How are you feeling right now? Uh, amazing, really good. <laughs> you uh, tend to run well here at Thunder Valley. You had, uh, you said this is your third final table, yeah. two wins in a second place. You know what, uh, home field advantage or, or what is it? Uh, I th- I, this one with the other ones, I thought was a lot of luck, and this one I really studied a lot the last two years. We really tried to improve my game. And I still had great luck. I mean, you can't, obviously you can't but win without great luck. Sure. But um, I'm really happy I play, how I played, especially like day one when, you know, the early stage of the tournament. You mentioned Paul Richardson, who had won before. A little inspiration yeah. for you. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that. Um, he's just someone I see here, I think, very highly of his game. And... Um, I know he used to be a chemist, you know, I'm like a mathematician, engineer kind of type person, so I just thought, well, yeah, yeah, if he can do it, I should be able to do it. <laughs> and now you have your first gold ring, a seat into the 2020 Global Casino Championship. Are you excited to, to go and compete in that and uh, have a shot at a bracelet? Um, yes, and this is the first time I've heard about that. That's amazing. That's great. When, when is it? It's in August at uh, Harris Cherokee. So it's uh, okay. you have to go cross country, but it's uh, yeah, I'll, it's a very I'll, you know, no, it'll be it'll be fun. It'll and, be awesome. And, All right, congratulations to Jamie Haletke on that win. Jeff, another big winner at the Thunder Valley Stop. Uh, we mentioned it briefly off the air, and I know you kind of like, yeah, where, where's he been? JC Tran. JC back in the mix. I haven't seen JC Tran. I mean, I guess that he showed he does show up in the summers at the World Series of Poker, but other than that, you know, I haven't seen him in a long time. Yeah, I had neither. He shows up during the high roller. Uh, Thunder Valley had a $3,250 buy-in 
high roller. It got 47 entries. And I believe JC Tran was one of them who rolled up on day two and late registered the thing. So he only had to put in a day's uh, work, ends up winning Beautiful. it for, yeah, for $49,000. Um, he beat the WPT's Tony Dunst in heads up play, which, uh, was, was kind of exciting. I hadn't, uh, you know, whenever I see Tony, he's usually in a, a professional capacity. So he's right. always dressed in one of his nice suits, always looking dapper. And when he showed up the first day I seen him there, he was wearing like a poker player's get up, you know, just a hoodie, maybe just rolled out a bat or what have you. And I had to do a double take like, Oh, that's Tony Dunst. I, I'm usually uh, used to seeing him, you know, dressed <laughs> to the nines, but, uh, yeah, it, um, uh, it was J.C. Tran's third career gold ring, and uh, Jeff Fisk was the reporter on that for Poker News. He got a little winner's interview with J.C. Here's what he had to say. All right, J.C., first of all, congratulations. Hey, Second career ring, I believe? I think it's my third. Third? Yeah. I know you've I won... I know you've won this exact event twice. Yeah, I won one like, I don't know, ages ago. Like, I don't really play many circuit events. So I know back in the days when they had at the Rio, I played, I won one there, that was my first, and I, the only time I ever played the game is here, so. So third career ring, how do things like rings and like bracelets and things like that, how do they, like what do they mean to you as far as those kind of accomplishments? You know, it used to be really cool for me to like, you know, shoot for a goal, to have like a bracelet or a ring or a PT tile, and then when you, you know, when you accomplish that, um, you know, you try to, you try to shoot for bigger goals and one of my biggest goals was uh, to funnel nine the uh, WSP main and I did that and then after that I kind of I kind of took it easy on poker kind of spent more time with the family and the kids and uh, you know that's that's one thing that I, I um, you know I told my wife like hey once we have kids I'm not gonna be hitting the circuit hard taking it easy uh, you know I, I enjoy coming out here because it's close to home 25 minute drive um, I really don't like to fly any, any further than Vegas for any tournaments. Um, you know, it's just, I mean, I got my kids are six and eight and they got a lot going on, sports, after school activities, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, it, I see other fathers and some of those guys are my friends. They're not around watching their kids grow up. And to me, you know, that's not, that's not where I want to be. You know, I want to, I want to stay closer to home. You know, I sign up a basketball game tomorrow. I coach it. I want to be there, etc. That kind of stuff. You know, and I, these are the things I don't want to. I don't want to miss. So, as far as playing circuit events everywhere else, you won't probably see me. You'll see me just mostly here. Okay. Nevertheless, obviously, you're still really good at poker. Where would you rank your game right now, as far as like, how how well do you think you're playing? Well, I've always compared poker to golf. Right. Okay. If you don't play a lot. You know, you can still probably get lucky, get, you know, hit a decent round here and there. And that's kind of where I'm at. You know, I, I don't play enough. Um, you know, when I had all my success, I played uh, volume. I played everything. I, you know, I played prelims up until mains. By the time main comes around, you know, my brain's warmed up. I'm ready to go. I'm in the groove. Uh, these, I kind of pop in and out. So I consider myself a washed up pro. Uh, I still got, I still got, you know, I still got it a little bit here and there. Every now and then, I, I pull a little nice close run, and uh, but I mean, I feel like uh, now that my kids a little older, I can probably play more tournaments. But I don't really have a set schedule where I'm just gonna start following every WP or every WSOP circuit or whatnot. It's sort of like, okay, there's a tournament here, let's try to make that. If not, it's no big deal. Came down to you and Tony Dunst. You guys are both really well known, great players. Do you have like history with Tony Dunst as far as playing him deep in tournaments like this? No, I actually okay. haven't had too many uh, hours with uh, uh, with Tony. I mean, he played really well, and uh, you know, it came down to me having Queens and he had Ace Ten. You know, earlier we had a couple big pots where you know I was lucky enough to have a no show, so kind of have him guessing. And um, you know, Tony's a great player. I got, I got you know, a lot of respect for him, and he's he's similar to to me in some ways. He doesn't play a ton of these tournaments because he's doing stuff with WPT or whatnot. So uh, when he does play, I see him run deep here and there, and you know, guys like that you'll see around the boat for a while. My last question for you: How do you celebrate tonight? I'm actually anything. gonna grab a quick bite and we jump right into the main because I don't think I can play tomorrow because I got okay. my son's a basketball game. Sure. I got I got. Uh, some other birthday plans with a bunch of January birthday friends. So, um, 
the goal is to try to bag tonight. If not, reevaluate tomorrow. I always like to play these tournaments. I hate missing it because there's there's not many that come to town. Sure. Um, but I have priorities. You know, I have to go and coach my son's game, and I enjoy doing that more than playing any tournament. So. So nothing crazy tonight. After no, no, no. Big, I'm just no gonna go grab a quick bite, and you'll see me right back in this main event. All right, congratulations to J.C. Tran. You know, he calls himself a washed-up pro. I don't know about that. You know, you can still ship high that. rollers. Uh, but it's kind of like Gelfond, right? Gelfond during his challenge when he was right. issuing it was saying washed-up pro. But, uh, you know, J.C. certainly has maybe taken a step back from the game uh, a little bit, not traveling as much and, and things like that, but clearly hasn't lost a beat uh, shipping that, uh, that there high roller. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. One more quick story that I wanted to hit before we get into um, our giveaway, because this is a this could be a tremendous feat. Now, this tournament might be all wrapped up by the time this podcast comes out. But how about Brian Altman, another final table at the WPT Lucky Hearts Poker Open down in Florida, looking to become the first player to win the same title twice. He won this very tournament back in season 13 for more than seven hundred twenty three thousand dollars. And Chad, each chip leader going into this final table would be pretty sick. You know what? I'm going to say it right now, Jeff. We got to get Brian on the podcast. Let's he's do gotta it. Be, yeah, yeah, he's one of those guys who I feel like just crushes every time he's in a tournament. He's going deep. Uh, every time I report on him, he looks like he's focused in. He's dialed in, and I feel like he just doesn't get the uh, recognition maybe that he deserves. Right? And, and he, I don't think he seeks that necessarily. But I still want to reach out to him and say, hey come on the podcast. Yeah. Let's talk a little poker, you know, regardless if he wins this or not. But, uh, you know, the fact that he's put himself in this position to do so is uh, pretty incredible. But uh, honestly, I'm not that surprised. Uh, he, like I said, he's just always going deep, always putting himself in these great positions. And uh, yeah, by the time uh, this podcast actually airs, this tournament should have played out. So if you want to know who uh, wins before our next episode, just go to pokernews.com. We will have a recap up, but uh yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, I'm going to be paying attention to that tournament today as it plays down to a winner. And he busted Phil Ivey in a World Series of Poker main event. You know, so how great of a poker career is that? All right, Chad, let the listeners know about this giveaway. It's a cool one at that. Sure, yeah. The uh, Borgata Winter Poker Open is happening right now in New Jersey. Poker News is there. We're going to be there to the bitter end, which is at the end of this month. And we're already looking forward to the Borgata Spring Poker Open, which I talked a little bit about earlier in the podcast is going to be part of that new East Coast Poker Tour, right? So we decided, you know what, let's do something fun. Let's do a giveaway where we award a seat to that Spring Poker Open. It's going to be a seat to the $2,700 buy-in championship event. It's going to be courtesy of Odds Checker US, who is a sister site to poker news they are going to put up that entry fee and all you need to do to enter is go give them your email there is a landing page best way to find it just go to poker news twitter or facebook links are being posted click on the link enter your email you're going to be entered for a chance to win we're going to select a winner and notify them via email on friday january 31st through, so the end of the month, by the time this podcast gets posted, you're still going to have a solid week to go sign up. And it's really as simple as that. You just put in your email, you're entered for a chance to win. Somebody is going to win their uh, seat into the $2,700 championship at the Borgata Spring Poker Open. And uh, who knows, maybe they can pull a Brian Altman, go deep, make the final <laughs> table and, uh, you know, turn it into a huge payday. All right. That's quite a giveaway. Be sure to jump on that. You enter in your email address and maybe you win a $2,700 main event seat. That, folks, is pretty cool. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode. It is very much appreciated. Thanks again to Run It Once. Again, you can catch the Galfon Challenge going on right now, twitch.tv slash run it once. It's going on throughout the next couple of weeks. Once.run slash pod for the deposit bonus, twitch.tv slash run it once to catch the Galfon Challenge. For Chad Holloway, I'm Jeff Platt. For our good friend, Sarah Herring, deuces.